Okay. So you have another minute or two for people to get signed on and then we'll start. <laughs> Okay, I guess at 11.15, we'll go ahead and, and begin. It looks like a few people are signed on, ready to go. hope everyone can hear me. Uh, this class, I first put together this class years ago as part of a photography club at the uh, Sandy Senior Center. And then uh, so we started working at the uh, Family History Center. I mentioned uh, the class and somebody said it might be a good idea to show this. It's just a kind of a fun class. It takes a little uh, detective work and it's challenging. I know a lot of people have these beautiful old photographs and you don't have a clue of what they're about or who is in them. and you don't, no one's given you any information on it. What's a real treasure is to find an old photograph with information on the back that tells you something about it. Uh, in this case, this is a photograph. It did have some information on the back, but what's more frustrating is that's the information that was on the back and it's not very helpful. So we don't know who dad is and whose mules those are, but anyway, that's dad and his mules. So we'll start out an important thing in identifying an old photograph is figuring out roughly when it was taken. Now we're not gonna be able to identify and tell you exactly who's in every photograph. Sometimes we will, we'll get to some places where maybe you can identify that. In other places, you won't be able to, but dating the photograph is, probably the most important part. And see some assess without having it, you won't have much luck in determining who's in the photograph. I'm assuming you're pulling out a photograph and you've got, uh, since the photographic era, it could be anywhere from 150 years old and that covers 150 years of family, genealogy, extended family. Um, so without knowing approximately when the photograph was taken, you're not gonna have much luck of knowing who's in the photograph or what or any personal information about them, what's in them. Uh, there are some things that can help you in identifying the time period when the photo was taken. And sometimes they don't. Children's photos can be a challenge, but some of the things that can help you are clothing styles. Uh, look at the individual in the photo, what are they wearing? Uh, Another one is hairstyles, especially for women who've changed over time. Men to some degree, you can look at old photos and kind of tell that's an older hairstyle, but women and fashions change. Uh, children, this might not be helpful. It, the, child, the picture on the screen, is that a boy or a girl? Way back when in photographs, the young boys were dressed as in dresses. Uh, hairstyles, when they don't have hair, it's kind of hard to tell what that is. I've heard some stories about why that happens. I'm assuming sometimes uh, you just have a hand-me-down and clothes were expensive back then and the dress is what you had. Uh, another option is maybe diapers are easier to change when the child's got a dress on rather than pants. Uh, one I've heard is during uh, different plagues that came through, they seem to affect boys more than girls. So the story is the wife's tale is that they would dress the boys as a girl and uh, hopefully the plague would pass by and not recognize them as being a boy. Uh, fashions change over time, so that'll help you with clothing. 
Um, there's books available on clothing and hairstyles. Also, you can search websites to kind of look at, at what uh, a lot of images on the website. You can. Oh, did I lose something here? Um, I hope everybody's still there. I just got a message. Something closed. Um, with just a little research on your on your part, you can find out a lot of information on those things. There's websites devoted to that. A little study. Uh, here's some examples. In these two photographs, one is my great great grandmother at age 19. Another one is my great great grandmother, a little older, but you can see how some of the hairstyles have changed. The clothing styles have certainly changed. Uh, another thing to look at in closing that's very telltale is a lot of people, photography wasn't real popular way back when, but for special occasions, people took pictures like when they were in the military. Uh, our, a lot of job related uniforms or more in old times people wore uniforms uh, for work. Uh, in this case, if we look at the photograph on the left, you can kind of date those uniforms around World War II. Uh, the individual in that picture on the right might look fairly young to be a soldier. He's more a Boy Scout age. That's actually true. That's my father. He ran away from home at age 15 and joined the army. Uh, he did have this photo taken with a friend of his. Uh, fortunately, he'd been in the army for about nine months and his mother found out where he went and went down and retrieved him. Uh, he was highly upset. They discharged him right there at the pier where he was about to get sent overseas. His discharge is dated two weeks before his 16th birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, he was angry and immediately ran away and joined the Merchant Marines. It was very fortunate looking back because his unit was sent to the Philippines and was in all of that involvement in Corregidor and the death marches and he's got a lot of friends that were involved in that but. But it's interesting to identify who's in these photographs and what the history is on the right hand side is my wife's great grandmother who worked as a nurse. And this was an ID picture and that's fortunate if you can find something like that, because it has the date stamped on it. And it kind of really helps you date that photograph. Otherwise, you'd rely on who's in it and who's in the uniform. Another thing to look at to date the photograph is what's in the background? What's the picture of? Here we have one that we found with my wife's uh, father's old slides. He's the individual on the left of the picture holding the Nazi flag. He served in Germany right at the end of World War II. It gives us a good idea looking at that background information, the captured armaments, the flag. It helps you date just when that picture was taken. Another, some other things in identifying the time period is uh, a lot of photographs are taken in front of houses. What's the air of that house? Is it a log cabin out in the woods? Is it a uh, craftsman type house real popular at the end of World War II, a more modern looking house. Uh, you can tell a lot by the by the era of the house. Another item is if it's inside a house or even out on a front porch, is there a piece of furniture in that house that you can identify as an heirloom or a style of furniture when that furniture was made? I know when we I was growing up, the popular thing was that dining room set that was all in chrome and had a vinyl top and matching chrome and vinyl chairs. You see something like that in the picture. It'll it'll date that photograph to about the 1950s. Uh, see, how did the landscape look? Uh, landscaping on homes, landscaping around buildings has changed over time. Uh, how has it changed over time? What's what was there that what's not what was there before and it's not there now? Uh, what's there now that wasn't there before? Uh, buildings that are no longer there that actually were there. An example of that, if you're familiar with the downtown area era and maybe served a mission or had someone serve a mission uh, back in the 50s and 60s, there was an old hotel up the street from the Hotel Utah that served as a mission home. Uh, if you're aware of that, that eventually was replaced when the MTC was built. 
and it became part of Deseret Gym. And then Deseret Gym came down and it's now the conference center. So if you can look for those things in the background, uh, whatever's in the background that you're familiar with that you might kind of date what's changed, what's there, what's no longer there, when were they actually there? Uh, another thing that can help you is, are there vehicles or machinery in there? Cars have changed over the years pretty consistently, unless you're in Germany and Volkswagens look the same for 50 years. Uh, but if there's a vehicle or a piece of machinery, is it modern machinery, old machinery? Is it a piece of horse-drawn machinery? Um, you can identify the photo, when the photo was taken within a very narrow range. Uh, here's an example. Usually it's more, this is more a participation thing when I'm in a class with people. But this is a photograph that I came across. And using information that you can find in the photograph, what are some of the hints? But I'll kind of walk you through it. It was fun to do this with a class where they can look at it. Maybe you can look and see if there's some things you can guess on there. Uh, the first thing is you've got that I would look for is the car. It, uh, immediately what jumps out, it's got a California license plate, which kind of tells you where the photograph was taken. If you look at the background, the palm trees, uh, that's typical of California. It's where I grew up and those palm trees that were that tall way back when were 20 or 30 feet tall when I was a child and now they're 100 feet tall. So that helps you kind of narrow it down. The other item we talked about is vehicles. Uh, if you look at the grill on the vehicle, you can get a close look and tell it's a Studebaker. Now, if you look, get online and you Google Studebaker images, it'll go through a whole bunch of images and it actually found an image of this actual car with the headlight, the grill, the fenders, the match that kind of helped me date that when it was by. So here's some of the things we found out. It was taken in Southern California. Uh, the license, we tell that from the license plate and the palm trees. Uh, by looking online, it was identified as a 1916 Studebaker. So we know that for a fact that was taken a little bit after 1916. The clothing styles, uh, based on the clothing styles and where that, what album this picture was found in, I'm guessing that the people were my great grandmother, probably around age 70 or my great-great-grandmother, my great-grandmother around 49 or 50, and her second husband, who uh, was much younger than her, at age 41. And we were able to verify this because just recently I was scanning some photos out of an album found in my mother's home and found this exact photograph. And she actually had it captioned that it was taken in 1920 with a uh, Lydia Land at 70 and Nora and Fred, who were my, she's my great grandmother and her second husband. Uh, another, just an interesting picture thrown in for interest. Uh, this is my grandfather and he drove a Hollywood tour bus and that was his Hollywood tour bus back in the 1920s or so. Uh, this we can go through quickly, unless you're really into technical stuff. It'll help you identify the photo if you're lucky enough to have an original photo. Often what you get is a copy of one of these different types. So you've got the daguerreotype. They were introduced to the world in about 1839, almost completely superseded in 1860. So you happen to have an original photo that will give you a date range of when that was taken. Then you've got a pretty valuable heirloom of a picture if you have that. So um, the calotype or talbotype, it was a photographic process introduced in 1841. It was one where it finally used, we're using a coated paper, which is closer to what we have nowadays. Uh, it comes from the, the Greek word uh, kalos, which means beautiful and tupos impression. So just some interesting history on photography. We've got the beautiful impression, the first name for photographs. Uh, the ambrotype was, was a collodial positive. We're getting a little more modern in using chemicals and things to develop the impression uh, from the Greek immortal and impression. 
So they, they plan on their photographs lasting a long time, which is, is nice because these old original photographs that you find are in wonderful condition compared to some of our more modern prints that seem to fade. And so it's more important to get those digitized and saved in a way that they won't, they can be restored and won't fade. Uh, introduced in the 1860s, and this was replaced by one that we're probably more familiar with, uh, the tintype. Uh, patented in 1856, uh, known as the melanotype or ferrotype from ferrous, meaning me metallic. And its widest use was the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, lesser used in the early 20th century. Now this, you may have some of these. I have two photo albums, which we found in my mother-in-law's home. Almost identical album, same family. One is a treasure and one is a source of frustration. One is regular photographs and one is tintypes, a whole photo album of tintypes. Uh, the frustration is someone went through the regular photographs and wrote on the back who was in the photograph and made those a treasure. We've had a wonderful time scanning those and putting them on family search. The 10 types, these beautiful old photographs and don't have a clue who was in them. So that's something we're working on and identifying that family. Uh, this is a picture from our album. It's a, a veteran of the War of 1812. It's from an original, a scan from an original 10 type. Uh, other lesser known options, the carte de vista. Some of these you might run across because they tend to look like postcards. They're small photographs uh, from 1854. Being widespread popularity when Napoleon got interested in photography. Uh, the cabinet cards came into existence. You might see those are through black and white impression. They almost look like a postcard, and some of them were printed as postcards to be mailed. 1890s to early 1900s, if you have a copy of those. Uh, the last cabinet cards were reproduced in the 1920s, as late as 1924. Yeah. Okay. Not only into identifying who is in the photograph, this is going to use, use a lot of your skills and knowledge. And uh, sometimes it can be done with great precision. Other times it's just guesswork. But with the right knowledge, you can make a pretty accurate guess of who's in it, or at least what family it's from, what branch of the family. Yes. Uh, and you can have a reasonable idea of who you're looking at in the photo. With your dad on Sundays um, to watch the tournament. Okay, identifying the location as we did with the, the car, the old Studebaker, where the photograph was taken, it will help. Where we are. You know, um, top. If you know the location, you can identify often, uh, make a reasonable guess as to the family or the person in the family. I apologize if you're hearing background noise. I don't know where that's coming from. But, uh, you compare the ages of the time period of the people in the photo to your knowledge of the family. Yes. yes he and here's an example of where that would work. This is a photograph we found of a log cabin. The identification on it said Hot Springs, Alaska, about 1920. Well, from my wife's knowledge of her family and from our genealogy, we know Hot Springs, Alaska is where her father was born. When was he born? 1916. He was born in 1916, so we're able to look at the photograph. He was born in a log cabin in Alaska. Mm -hmm. We've got four people. Looks like a young, young boy. He had an older sister and his parents. So we're able, based on family history and a little bit of information on the photograph, find out who was in that photograph. Another helpful, is there any family heirlooms in the photograph? Any things you recognize? Oh, there's that, that clock that great grandpa always had on his mantle. It's there in the background and we can find out where it was taken and uh, get a pretty good estimate of, 
Um, who was in the picture or where the picture was taken? The family it belonged to. Uh, yeah, the family who the heirloom belonged to, uh, where that heirloom originated. Uh, like we have one that we have hanging on a wall. It's an old cuckoo clock that came from her father brought it back from World War II. And uh, so you spot heirlooms like that. They might date that photo photograph uh, from oral family histories if someone talked about that thing in the background. Uh, then you can make a reasonable guess as to who was in the photograph. Another helpful thing is if you recognize one or more of the people in the picture as someone you've seen before, are you seeing them in another photograph? Uh, how old do they appear? If you can recognize someone in the photograph, then we'll give you a clue to who the other people are in the photograph. Uh, if you can tell from someone in there, oh, that's great grandpa. He looks like he was about 15. That will kind of date the photograph and help you identify the other people in the picture. Uh, it's especially easy if there's a child with family around them in the picture. Uh, if you recognize who that child is, you can kind of guess ages pretty well and figure that out. One thing, don't forget, you're all genealogists. You have some skills. You're good at this stuff. Uh, here's a picture we found in an old album. It had a little bit of information on it, but not much. And we'll kind of walk through how that might work. This wasn't in the last lesson when I did it because we were watching a TV show that came on called The Genetics Detective. And she uses genetics and genealogy to solve crime, like some people at the center have used it to find birth parents, those kind of things. I thought maybe it worked to find who's in the photo. Yeah. So the first thing we checked, is there any information on this photo? And there was. Yeah. And it says, Estelle, Harry, and the babies. So, you know, that's that's some very useful information, although it doesn't identify the photo. What did help was that where was the photo found? In this case, we found it in some photo albums out of my wife's mother's house. And that's our Hendrickson Applegate line from New Jersey. So we know we can kind of narrow that down from there. And then thought, my wife's done a lot of genealogy on that line. Are any of these families in family search? Uh, in this case, uh, Hendrickson and Applegate were my wife's great grandparents. So we kind of narrowed that down to family search to see what we could find. And we come up with going back to Cornelius Hendrickson, which is my wife's great grandfather. And as we go down through family search, there's my wife's grandmother. And down here is an Estella, which thinks, well, maybe that's helpful. There is an Estella in the picture. Let's see what we can find out about Estella and see if we have any information on there. And we go to her page and we find Estella has a husband named Herman Henry Nagel, whose nickname you went by Harry. So we've got Harry and Estella, and there's three children in the picture. And he said with a baby, it makes it a little easier because there's the baby and there's the birth order. And it was pretty easy on the photograph to tell what the birth order of the children is, identify them, and also able to scan the picture and then add those photographs to family search and their little cameo pictures. Now there's pictures of them and some information on family search. Okay, so now we have the full names and we have the birth birth dates. We can determine the names and birth dates and children. Also, what can we do? We can now add the photographs to family search. Uh, we can tag that photograph in memories. We can tag the individuals. And we can actually create a little portrait for their personal information page to put that with just a little research, a little care and using your genealogy scares, uh, skills. Uh, sometimes you can use the process of elimination. Uh, use your knowledge of aspects of the photo to determine who the person 
candy. Eliminate everyone you can. And sometimes, eventually, you'll be left with one or a handful of choices of who's in the picture. Another clue that we've discovered a while back is professional photographers always had a copyright or a stamp or something on the front or the back of the photograph. Uh, so who was the photographer? Sometimes you can Google the name of the studio or the photographer and find out a little bit of information. Search for the photographer's name. Uh, it's usually on the front. And occasionally the photographer or the studio name or location will be on the back of the photo if you have the original print from the studio. Uh, research the photographer. Uh, we have a lot of photographs that are that way, and a lot of them we trace back, and it says such and such a studio in New Jersey. Well, that immediately takes it to my wife's side of the family because that's where her line, line of the family comes from. If we get any from the Midwest or the Southern states, we know that's probably my side of the family. So do a little research on the photograph and see what you can come up with. When he went out of business. Uh, yeah, when they when he was there, when they went out of business, it'll help you date that photograph and find out who's in there. Uh, again, this refers to uh, the genetics detective. It's something else we're trying. We haven't had results on it yet. Uh, based on that show where they would find out who was possibly a participant in the crime by taking the DNA that they would find in the crime scene, trace that DNA back up a line and then back down another line to find a cousin or someone, which would help them identify that unknown person that they had DNA for. Well, we thought of that using it here to track down extended family and search up and down your family tree to find other branches. Uh, my wife's done that with that photo album that, that we know comes from her line of looking through family search or finding extended cousins, extended relatives, and asking them for help on identifying what's who's in the pictures. Uh, you know, find that second or third cousin that might still be alive, that might recognize the people in the photograph, uh, and offer to swap information. You know, I'll send you a photograph if you'll share who's in it. And if you want to do that, I have some more I'll share with you. Uh, you can use social media and Facebook to do the same kind of things if you can track down those extended relatives. Uh, the photograph here is an old tin type. We're guessing this lady looks to be a, a little dressed in a little Spanish type of ancestry. Uh, my wife's traced back of, to a family member who was a sea captain who went to Spain, married someone way back when from Spain. So she's working now to go kind of down that family line and see if she can find another relative that may recognize that photograph or know who's in that. Uh, and once you've done that, And don't if it's a different photograph. Now most photographs are digital. So if you want to stay around, this is part two. Let's see if we can get it running. It's how to write on the back of a digital photograph. Okay, I hope everybody's seeing that now. If you're not familiar with made metadata, it's a very important feature of a digital photograph. It gives you a whole lot of information about that picture, and we'll explain a little bit about what that is. Uh, simply put, metadata is data that describes other sorts of data. Now, in a photograph, your basic data is the picture. It's that data that describes all of the pixels, all the little dots that make up that picture. So it's the photograph. The metadata describes information about that photograph. 
and working with metadata will make managing your pictures much easier and much, much quicker. Uh, for example, if you know one or several metadata entries, you could make searching for pictures a whole much quicker process than going through hundreds or thousands of photographs. I know I've scanned my, my parents' photograph albums and my wife's parents' photograph albums, and her father was into photography. And so literally, when I back up my file, it's a file of about 80,000 photographs. And if I want to find a picture of a single individual, that's a lot to go through unless I've taken advantage of metadata. I'll tell you a little bit about how that works. A lot of it is created automatically. It's usually very straightforward and basic information. It's, it's created when you click that button and take the picture, it records the picture and it records some other things. Like if your camera is GPS uh, qualified, it'll record GPS information in that picture, the GPS coordinates of where it was taken. It records the file size. How big is that picture? Uh, the file size becomes important if you're emailing photographs because a lot of the email systems restrict the size of the number of pictures and size of pictures you can send. So it's nice to know how big that file is and how many pictures you can actually tag onto a, an email. It'll tell you the file extension, which is whether it's a, a JPEG or a TIFF or all these different things that may or may not have any meaning to you but it's there if you need it. It can also be entered manually and it provides you a chance to be much more thorough. And you can input data that you think is relevant and, and it will help you find that picture. It helps you locate files much more efficiently. And I'll show you a little bit about how to do that. So now, metadata in photography, it describes the image. Uh, a digital camera adds some of this information automatically. It'll put on the date taken, the date it was accessed, the date it was edited. Uh, all of these, if you're doing things in the camera, it'll also tell you, if you know it or don't know it, it'll tell you the type of camera or phone that you took the picture with. It'll give you the information about uh, what, what settings you use to take that picture, the aperture, focal length, shutter speed, ISO, et cetera. It'll even tell you whether you had a flash attachment that was used or not. So metadata that describes the image itself and its content can only be entered manually. And that includes keywords. And that's, that's things of, if you wanna identify photos of family reunion or uh, of what branch of the family or genealogy photos or however you want to put in keywords to help you find that photo later, you can add notes, uh, put in notes about that. And the next one important is tags. You can write down and identify who is in that photograph and it will be permanently attached to that photograph. But you can put in copyright information. Uh, we're probably not a whole lot interested in that unless you're taking pictures professionally. Um, so we'll go to the next, how does metadata help? It's how do you find a specific photograph amongst thousands of photos in the metadata without metadata. Uh, searching for that file can be a long and tiring process. Uh, with metadata, searching for files can be uh, a long process. Uh, when metadata is known, it allows you to search based on image content such as date, creation, time, copyright, title, other specifics. Uh, how you name that photograph, you can go in and change the name of a photograph fairly quickly. I usually add the date and a basic item about it on, on the photograph name itself, that file name. Then you can narrow down the results very effectively. A uh, quick note on copyright, it does provide a way to protect it. It can be removed uh, in some cases, but a lot of professional photographers will still use it. Uh, to help protect their images. But take a little time when you download your photographs onto your computer or whatever, or you've taken this scanned image and you find out about it, give a little ten attention to the metadata. Make sure you spend time optimizing what information you find on there. Add a lot of descriptive words to that picture. I'll show you how to do that in just a minute, and then you can kind of work through it. It's kind of 
doing it and then uh, you see how it works and then it gets easier to do. Uh, you can put on the location, the event, the people, uh, the type of photograph. Uh, if you're kind of into doing different things, wildlife, uh, landscape, portraits, you can identify the, the genre. Uh, anything relevant to that particular photograph, you can add as, as notes, uh, including the creator who took that picture, uh, other copyright information. Uh, GPS coordinates, you can add those if they weren't added automatically by your camera. <laughs> okay, if you're using Windows Explorer, here's a quick way to do that and explain just what that is. If you click on your photos, go to your photographs, you'll see a page like that that brings up your detailed photographs. Uh, if you hover over, if you pick a photo in there, and hover over it, it will bring up some of the basic metadata. In this case, a JPEG file. It was taken uh, May 31st, 2016. Uh, the rating is if you want to rate your photographs by how much you really like them, you can do the star thing and put it in there. I don't usually do that. I think all my photos are wonderful. So <laughs> uh, it tells you the dimensions of that photo, how many pixels, uh, wide, how many pixels tall, and it gives you the file size. If you, then hover over that photo, and if you right click on that photo, it will bring you up an additional page of information over here that you can look at. And on the front, you can see it has the general information of uh, when the photo was taken, the type of photo, some of what you've already seen. What you want to go to is the details and click on the details of the photo. And that brings us to the details page. And that's where you can put in a whole lot of things, the title of your photo, the subject, uh, how many stars you want to put on it if you're interested in that. Uh, tags, this is where you can add people, put in names of people that you want to put in there, your comments and notes. Uh, authors, if you want to put in who took the picture, when the picture was taken, if it was if it came out of a camera. Now, a scan will only tell you when that picture was scanned. It won't tell you when it was taken, of course. Uh, if it's taken with a digital camera, that information will be there. Uh, and let's see, then you can scroll down. As you look at that, you can scroll down on that same page and find lots more information. If you're kind of a photography buff, it's where it tells you what camera it was taken with, the settings, exposure time, all the information. That's handy if you're really in photography and you think something like, well, that was a beautiful sunset and the sun's going down. I want to look at that photo and see how I had my camera set to take that picture. That's kind of useful. Other than that, it's, it's not too helpful. Okay, the inner metadata using Windows uh, Photo, and this will differ depending on the software you have. You can do this at it with uh, your editing software. They'll all be a little bit different, but they're kind of similar. So uh, to enter it using Windows Photo Gallery, double click on the photo, and that brings up the picture, and then select Info up here from the toolbar. And that adds a section on the side where you can add your tags. And here I put the two individuals that were in there. I continue scrolling through your photographs, add your tags as you go through. If useful, add multiple tags. If there's two or three or four people in there, you can tag as many people as you want. Um, Okay, then if you want to search how easy that makes out of this whole database of photographs, I can type in, you can type in a search term up here, like Spiral Jetty, that was a photo club field trip. And out of all those photographs, you do search, and suddenly you get your four photographs from the Spiral Jetty field trip. Or you can search, do the same thing for a single individual if you add Rick up here at the top and search for Rick. 
Now we get all the photographs that Rick is in. And that about sums that up. Um, I have one story I'd like to tell you about, though, that involves a photograph uh, before we're actually totally done. Um, this happened. My mother was searching for information on her grandfather, George Wise. They'd been searching for him for years, had very little information on him. And about the time she was, had been searching about 10 years, my youngest sister came down with cancer. She was young, about 30. Uh, it was terminal. She reached a point. She was in a conversation with my mother. And she said to my mother, I don't know what life is going to be like on the other side, but if I can take a message to somebody, what would it be? And my mother quickly responded, tell George, if we don't get a little help from him, we're done with his side of the family. And it was kind of a family joke. But within three months after my sister dying, things started to happen. Uh, the first one is my mother suddenly felt that she should send for a birth certificate for George. Uh, and she thought, no, that's kind of a waste. I did that before and didn't get anything back. But she thought, well, I'll act on that prompting. And she sent away where she thought there would be a birth certificate for George. And she got one back. But it was a delayed filing birth certificate that didn't have any more information than what we already knew when he uh, when he was born and his name. <clears throat> so my mother called me up after getting that and said, I think there's something on here I'm missing. And she was living in Southern California. We were living up here in Utah. And I said, well, read it to me. So she read the whole front of it and nothing new. And so I said, is that everything front and back? And she turned it over and she said, oh, there's something on the back. And as she looked through that carefully, she said, it's very faintly. It looks like it was written in pencil. It said, copy mail to Beckley, West Virginia. And we thought, we don't know anybody in Beckley, West Virginia. All we know is that her mother and her brother were separated by divorce. She'd never seen her that uncle. Her mother hadn't seen her brother since, you know, for 40, 50 years, didn't know where they were. And so we were looking at that and I was talking to my wife and thought, well, at least we have a birth date. We can do the uh, family history work. We can do his temple work. And my wife said, no, look at his birth date. It hasn't been the right amount of time to do his work. 110. 110 years because you don't have a death date. And I thought, well, I, we're pretty sure he's dead. And they said, no, he might still be alive based on the genealogy plan. So we thought, just on a whim, I thought, I'm going to call information in Beckley, West Virginia, and see what happens. So we called information and said, in Beckley, West Virginia, do you have a George E. Wise listed with a phone number? And they did. And I thought, this would be my grandmother's father, my wife's, my mother's grandfather, or, you know, my great grandfather. Uh, so we dialed the number. I did, and I was too cowardly, and I didn't know who was going to answer. It was late Sunday evening. My wife said she'd do it. Nobody knows her. So she dialed the phone, and it was a good thing she did because an elderly lady answered the phone. And we asked some questions about we're looking for a George E. Wise. And we gave her a little bit of information that said, you know, he had a sister, who was my grandmother's name, named um, Hazel. And she got a little suspicious and was like, how do you know this information? And we told her our connection and said, "Is could this possibly be my grandmother's brother? And she said, it might be because he had a sister that he's talked about that he hasn't seen for you know, decades. And she said, I don't know much of the family history, but I have another son that does. And I said, could we have his number? And we'll call him and talk to him. And she says, well, I don't want to give out his number, but 
if you give me your number, I'll let him know. He lives in Florida. So we gave him the number and he was very interested because the next day, Monday morning, we got a phone call from Lyle Wise, who had been a half brother to my grandfather. And uh, he said, yes, he knows a lot about the family. He said his mother's name was, what was his mother's name? Mary Powers Harris was his mother's name. And he said, great, what do you know about him? And he said, nothing. She was a very private lady and didn't talk about much about her past, but that was her name. But what he did have, and he sent to my mother, was a photograph. The photograph was of a house, and he said, all I know is that my mother said that she would go, it was his grandmother, my grandmother said she would go visit this house because she had family there, and it was in a town in New Jersey. Picture of a house with a mailbox. We got the picture and my sister's looking at it and says, we can't have come this far to have nothing. And I feel like there's something in that photograph that will help us. So she got out, she studied the photograph, looked at it, and there was an address on the mailbox. So we knew the town and she wrote uh, to, who we, it may, to whom it may concern letter to the address on the mailbox and said, this may sound strange, but my great grandparents uh, this case would have been great great grandmother, my sister writing it, used to come there with my great grandfather as a child to visit. Do you know anything about the people that used to live in that house or own that house? Well, she got this amazing letter back in the mail that says, Yes, I know exactly who it was because that was my mother's sister that would come visit. And he said, I remember their visits. He, this gentleman was in his 90s. And he said, I would, I remember them come visit. And my mother's name is, and that's the sister to your mother's name, who was Mary. And he said, by the way, I'm including a letter. And he said, my father put this together, had attorneys research it, and put this letter together and gave it to me and said, someday someone will ask for it. And he said, I'm in my 90s, and you're the only one that's asked for it, so here it is. She opened that letter, and it was like starting with my grandfather, eight generations back through the history of the Civil War and the Revolutionary War and back into England, generation after generation of father to grandfather to great-grandfather to great-great-grandfather to spouses to children. We've used that letter since that time. We've submitted almost 3,000 names to the temple. And in researching based on that letter and branching out to other family members, it's gone back to uh, England and Ireland and into families with property that have very extensive regulations or very extensive records. And from that photograph and an address on that photograph, that has resulted in that much work. So this is why we're kind of interested in uh, identifying photographs, using photographs for genealogy purposes, document the work you've done on those, put them on family search so others can benefit from them. And I guess in conclusion, as we come to this, I found this quote that says, we, we've not succeeded in answering all your problems. The answers we have found only serve to raise a whole set of new questions. And isn't that it with genealogy? As soon as you find someone, you immediately have questions. Who was their, who were their parents? Who was their spouse? Who were their brothers and sisters? So in some ways we feel as we feel we are as confused as ever, but we believe we are confused on a higher level and about more important things. <laughs> and that includes the lessons. I appreciate you participating in this. Uh, I wish we could do this in person. Um, let me see what's in this. Uh, let's see if there's any messages until next week. Okay, I guess the notes I have, I haven't noticed if there's any questions, but I was late logging in to explain why we have Larry instead of Janet. I I didn't think Janet was scheduled to do this class. I was, so... I'm not sure what class Janet was teaching. 
uh, if others can mute their mics, we can hear. Oh, good. I guess that was the background noise I was hearing. Uh, I don't know what, what the mess up with the schedule was, but I guess Janet, hopefully Janet will be teaching another class. She'd be a great teacher. The information's on mute. Uh, and someone said thank you. Uh, there's a note that says, I guess Janet postponed her class that said it should be doing that next time. Um, and some thank yous, and thank you for tuning in. And feel free to get in touch with me. I work up at the tech center. If you have any questions about this or scanning or doing anything on photographs, uh, I'd be glad to help out. So I thank you for your participation and that's all I have. So.